So extremely recently, we've discussed one of the most exciting studies in regards to abiogenesis. The question of life's origin from non-living matter and how all of this potentially started. Now, the video about this is in the description, but in essence, it was an experimental evidence that there was a very high chance a lot of life potentially started from relatively widespread organic molecules, which then interacted with RNA and started forming slightly more complex structures. But the thing is, this is pretty much where the study ends, because when it comes to the origins of life, there is still this one major mystery. Even though we have a lot of this prebiotic synthesis and a lot of these initial polymers and vesicles, and even potentially signs of protocells. As you can see from this picture, there are still quite a lot of question marks about what happened next. How exactly did the first complex cells form? And how exactly did all of this then start to evolve into more and more complex life? And so in this video, we're going to actually focus on this very recent study from the Department of Life Sciences at Imperial College London with the title, The Unreasonable Likelihood of Being. This is actually more of a mathematical exploration, but it does present us with a somewhat bizarre and somewhat difficult to answer question that once again can kind of be summarized as these question marks. Even though we've made incredible progress piecing together a lot of clues from ancient rocks, laboratory experiments, and even meteorites, when it comes down to it, in order to form some of these first tiny living cells, something very specific had to happen on the planet, because the overall chance of this just happening is, right now, kind of sort of improbable, or at least extremely unlikely, based on this recent research. And so let's explore these ideas from a slightly different perspective, and then maybe come up with certain explanations and certain conclusions. But I guess here we have to start with a brief summary. Imagine a young Earth. Four and a half billion years ago, it was not blue and green, it was instead very chaotic and extremely geologically active. Lots of volcanic activity, lots of collisions from all over the place, and an extremely different atmosphere, most likely enriched in gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia. But very likely, no oxygen. But I guess crucially, there was potentially liquid water. A vast empty ocean that was already present 4.4 billion years ago and was already interacting with all of these rocks. And so, for many decades, the initial proposition of how life started was referred to as the primordial soup hypothesis. This was first proposed by the Soviet Alexander Oparin back in the 1920s, and the idea was that early warm oceans, containing a lot of chemical compounds, potentially caused a lot of chemical reactions that eventually became more and more complex and created a bunch of organic stuff, forming what the scientists referred to as the primordial soup with this idea getting a major boost in 1953. This was the now famous Miller-Urey experiment. Stanley Miller and Harold Urey simulated early Earth conditions, zapping mixtures of gases and water vapor with electrical sparks. And here they were able to produce a bunch of amino acids and a lot of more complex organic molecules, some which are technically fundamental blocks of all life on the planet. So basically here they produced a bunch of Lego blocks. With some of the additional experiments discovering similar organic molecules, including amino acids, sugars, and nucleobases, even in outer space. A lot of meteorites seem to contain them as well, and so they could have also been delivered from outer space. And that meant that Earth had a lot of these Lego blocks all over the place. But here's where the real challenge begins. How do these simple blocks spontaneously organize themselves into something as complex as a living cell? Now, the conclusion from that previous video was that a lot of chemical reactions can start producing RNA and start producing some of the initial interactions including some of these protocells, but that's a far cry from a legitimate cell capable of reproduction and evolution, and of course capable of sustaining itself and not dying. And so this leap from basic molecules to first self-sustaining protocell is really what this mystery is all about and what the study is trying to explore. Because right now there is this giant chasm, or once again, a bunch of question marks. And so this brings us to this 2025 study by Robert Andres. And here the study approaches this problem not from chemical or biological perspective, but through concepts of information theory. Essentially trying to quantify the sheer number of ordered instructions a typical simple cell would need in order to function. Or I guess think of it as a highly detailed instruction manual for a complex machinery. And the premise was to break down the total information content of a minimal protocell, representing everything in bits. And while surprisingly the DNA or genetic information seems to represent only a tiny part of the entire information of the cell. It's only approximately million bits in total, at least for some of the more simple bacteria. But the structural information, like the shapes of proteins, 
and how they fold into those shapes seem to represent at least 100 million bits in total. But the most significant part is referred to as dynamic information, or how all of the thousands of biochemical pathways and processes seem to be orchestrated inside the cell, usually through molecules like RNA. And this is a perfectly synchronized dance, which in terms of information seems to contain approximately 1 billion bits. And so here over a billion bits of information is required in order to make the cell actually work. But the study also identifies something very crucial. Here it's referred to as the melting library. On early Earth, a lot of complex organic molecules were not very stable. They would usually degrade due to factors like water, UV radiation, oxidation, or just being in the heat in just a few hours, maybe a couple of days. Here the study refers to this as persistence time, how long useful chemical structures would be able to last. And so here a good comparison would be something like a library. Imagine a library with approximately 10 million different books, and each of these books would self-destruct 24 hours after you start reading it. And well, if this was a cell here, in order to prevent the cell from being destroyed, you would need to read approximately 100 books every single second in order to prevent the cell from dying. And so once again, when trying to look at this and trying to understand how protocells eventually turn into actual cells, we first need to realize that all of this very likely happened in under 500 million years. And in order for a protocell to become an actual cell, you would need to acquire that 1 billion bits of information in order to then become self-sustainable. And so if we assume some kind of a linear evolution, kind of like adding one brick at a time to a wall, in order for all of this to happen in 500 million years, you would only need to add approximately 2 bits of information every year, which in theory is possible. But the study argues that in order to form a protocell, this evolutionary process would unlikely to be so linear. It would more likely to be some kind of a random walk. Basically, all of these mutations would happen randomly, and even though sometimes you would add information, sometimes the cell might also lose it. So kind of like trying to build some kind of a sandcastle on the beach, but the tide comes in every day and washes everything away. And so here, if some of the molecules disappear really quickly, or basically if their persistence time is too short, any small step toward complexity would usually be erased completely before the molecules can become useful. And so one of the surprising conclusions in the study is that the spontaneous assembly of bacteria from poro cells could potentially become cosmologically implausible, requiring more time than the age of the universe. Assuming, of course, all of this happens randomly, and assuming that these molecules do not last very long, and disappear after just a few hours or maybe a couple of days. Which means that simple random chemistry alone is extremely unlikely to have done the trick and is extremely unlikely to have resulted in the first bacterial life, at least according to this informational model. And so what does this new study tell us about the formation of life? And what's the overall conclusion so far? Well, first it seems to suggest that in order for abiogenesis to have happened, we need to have more than just primordial soup and a lot of time. Or basically just random chemistry seems to not be enough. There still needs to be some kind of a specific mechanism that we still don't understand. And though biologically we don't really know what could have happened, we still have some potential explanations and of course some explanations that are maybe just a little bit more exotic. For example, one explanation is that maybe there was some kind of a form of physical or chemical bias that possibly involved some kind of compartments or maybe tiny bubbles, such as for example tiny pores inside rocks or bubbles on certain surfaces that would end up protecting these delicate molecules, thus giving chance for prior cells to evolve into real cells with a much more linear progression. This was actually explored in some of the previous studies and has been shown to happen in certain locations, such as maybe hydrothermal vents. Alternatively, there is maybe an explanation involving autocatalytic networks, basically molecules that help to create more of themselves, thus stabilizing the progress and providing a large, easily accessible source of these molecules, even though they get destroyed all the time. Once again, locations like deep sea hydrothermal vents seem to be perfect for a lot of these chemical reactions. Here we have unique chemistry, protected environments, and tons and tons of available energy. Or maybe there's an alternative explanation to all of this. Maybe none of this was linear, and maybe evolution in general is not linear, but instead has these very abrupt phase transitions and usually involves sudden emergence. And so here some kind of a complex system could suddenly click into place, like for example water quickly turning into ice when conditions are just right. And this would involve chemical networks that spontaneously self-organize and self-amplify by passing the need for incredibly long persistence of time for individual molecules. And so here we have at least two potential explanations. Obviously 
actually no evidence yet, but definitely something to consider. And then we have the exotic explanation as well. What if life, of course, did not start on Earth, and what if it came from somewhere else? And specifically, the other possibility here is what's known as panspermia. The general idea is that life, or its building blocks, did not start on Earth, but arrived from space. Once again, we have quite a lot of evidence that many building blocks already exist out there, so there's already some evidence out there. But this study actually focuses on the slightly different version, directed panspermia, a much more speculative idea championed by scientist Francis Crick, who, as you probably know, also co-discovered DNA. And so in this hypothesis, maybe an advanced extraterrestrial civilization deliberately seeded Earth with microbial star kits. Kind of like that scene from one of the Alien movies. And this 2025 Andres study acknowledges this proposition as one of the possible explanations, mostly because of the immense informational hurdles required for abiogenesis on Earth in such a short time. And here, directed panspermia, while speculative and obviously completely unproven, remains a logically open alternative. But to some extent, it also violates the famous Occam's razor. This is definitely not the simplest explanation. Although here this explanation does highlight something really important. It highlights how challenging the problem actually is. The problem of explaining abiogenesis, especially when it comes to a protocell turning into a functioning cell that then starts to evolve by itself. And though right now there is no scientific evidence for any of these propositions, this is still a somewhat intriguing proposition and a somewhat interesting idea. But at the same time, this study also brings back another important proposition, the rare earth hypothesis. The hypothesis that suggests that intelligent life, or possibly any life, might be incredibly rare in the universe. And not just because habitable planets are rare, but because these evolutionary transitions, especially transitions from simple chemistry into complex biological chemistry, and especially formation of intelligent life, may be individually extremely improbable and super difficult to achieve anywhere out there. And so here, the fact that intelligent life took approximately four and a half billion years to form on our planet, and also the fact that we have a limited window of habitability left before our sun makes our planet uninhabitable, as a matter of fact, only a few hundred million years left on Earth before it becomes basically inhospitable, suggests that a lot of these transitions like abiogenesis or the emergence of complex cells might be very difficult and may only happen extremely rarely within a planet's lifetime. With this new 2025 study by Andres, informationally quantifying one of the first steps, and possibly most fundamental steps, the very first spark of life. And so what's the overall conclusion we have right now in regards to abiogenesis and possible solutions based on what we know so far? Well, for one, I guess there's really no solution yet, but based on several other studies and what we know from different experiments, it looks like spontaneous emergence of even the simplest poro cells would only be possible in only certain conditions on early Earth. We still don't really know exactly what it would be, but hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean have always been one of the potential such locations. At the same time, based on these studies, we know that it's not enough to have the right chemical building blocks. They must still be organized and maintained in a very specific and actually highly improbable way that even over geological timescales would be very difficult to achieve unless there was something else we're still missing. And so random chemical interactions do not explain the formation of life. And that means that for life to have started on Earth, something very specific had to happen. Maybe it involves some kind of a rapid self-organization and some kind of a really dramatic jump in evolution, possibly involving sudden collective self-organization of chemical networks, or maybe it involved very specific persistent environments that protected many of these molecules from being destroyed. So possibly some kind of protective compartments, such as various porous rocks, that allowed for various reactions to be amplified, creating tiny protective bubbles. Or maybe life came from somewhere else after all. So I guess think of it as some kind of a helping cosmic hand. But because this is a very hypothetical proposition, and because there's basically no evidence for any of this, this idea of panspermia right now is extremely unlikely. Ultimately, though, abiogenesis remains one of the biggest puzzles we have in terms of biology. And this is, of course, a puzzle we're going to revisit many times until we have even more experiments and even more data. And even in just the last few years, there's been some incredible experiments that already explain so much more about all of this and provide us with specific data on how life potentially started. You can find some of these videos in the description. And though this new study doesn't provide us with any answers, it does provide us with important questions pointing us toward a critical analysis that once again highlights how difficult it is for life to just form through chemical means alone. And also reminding us of, well, this. 
And so based on the study and a lot of previous studies, the fact that you and I exist seems to be an almost improbable event. But until future discoveries, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a general membership that grants you early access and a few more things. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.